Well, it's great to be here tonight. It's always wonderful for me to have an opportunity to be at St. Andrews, and especially so for a couple of reasons tonight. One is that I know that you're in the middle of uh, an amazing and important season of change. No church tends to like that. That's a time of vulnerability. It's a time of disruption. You have plenty of that already, so uh, you add to it a pastoral change, and all of you know better than I do what all that has meant for you already. But I think it's uh, important for me to say to you how important this church is, how stable and life-giving it has been and is, how how assured I am of its future and how much I want to say that places like Fuller and many, many other places around the country care deeply about what's happening in the life of your church and are praying for you and for the transition. And also I want to say another great reason to be here tonight is that when I heard that Rich was leaving, I thought what a gift it was that Advent was almost the next thing around the corner because what Advent does is that it continuously every year brings us back to first things. It always brings us back to the most foundational things that are at the very core of the Christian gospel and at the core of this congregation's life. And it roots your story with all of the disruption and uncertainty that this particular time has in a much bigger narrative. And frankly, I think it's always very helpful to us to just go back and remember there's a bigger story There's a lot more to the story than we may necessarily be focusing on when we look only at our own personal circumstances or our local setting. So I hope tonight as we look at the first chapter of the Gospel of Matthew that it will be a source of great encouragement to you because your story, my story, the world's story is set in the context of this great story. So as we turn to Matthew chapter one, let me offer a word of prayer. Oh God, how grateful we are that you, the the keeper of the great story, the story of all creation, the story of humanity, the story of your people, that you, O oh God, are the one who will speak to us tonight. May we have ears to hear, to hear a word that comes from you, that lands right in our own circumstances, our lives, our world, our individual circumstances, this church, this community, this part of the United States, this nation, and this world. Oh God, give us ears to hear some of this great story and its good news tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 1 is not a a chapter that is usually read extensively. It's like the part that everybody skips over. You immediately leap from the opening verse, which is pretty good, an account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You could hardly get a better opening line that announces that what's going to follow from this is the very best thing that Matthew has to offer. That is what he's trying to tell. But then, the very next thing that starts happening is this classic Old Testament unfolding of a genealogy where so-and-so begets so-and-so begets so-and-so begets so-and-so. This is not the makings necessarily of what we might think of as a great sermon. And yet I would want to suggest that, that we dare not jump over this. We're not going to read the whole thing, but I want you to grasp what it is that's really happening. Matthew is the most concentrated in his awareness of the good news of what Jesus Christ is, is a story that's rooted in the long story of God's people, Israel. And it's the gospel that quotes what we would call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, more than any of the other gospels does. It's rooted in the depth and scope of the the Hebrew Jewish tradition. And out of that, he wants to lay the groundwork. This didn't spring out of nowhere. He's going to go on and spend the next 28 chapters talking about this person named Jesus. But that story is rooted in a much longer, deeper story. He announces at the beginning an account of the genealogy, and then he begins to give it to us. Let's just feel a little of the rhythm of this. I'm just going to read the first six verses or so. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. Now this is the first, I would suggest, great surprise. We're going along fairly traditionally. It's a male genealogy. It's the story of this blue blood line that you think is going to reach the pinnacle of the Messiah of Israel. This is the very, very best bloodline that you could think or might expect would explain and provide for the salvation of Israel. And yet all of a sudden, right in the beginning verses, suddenly the name Tamar arrives. This is not one of the great 
heroes of Israel's life. This is not a name that was endlessly reproduced in Israel's life. Not every family decided to call their daughter Tamar. It's an unexpected woman's name and an unexpected story. And Tamar is a person who complexifies things about Israel's story. God intends to do certain things through the 12 tribes and the 12 sons of Israel. And then and then there's other things that happen in Tamar's story, marrying two of Tamar's sons. And the rest of the narrative I'll leave to further detail, but it's an unexpected story. And Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Aram, and Aram, the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. Ooh, now this, again, an unexpected name. This is the kind of name that people talk about over holiday meals, not at the table, but really in the kitchen, right? Rahab gets mentioned in the kitchen. Rahab is a story, again, of an unexpected name, not a person that was anticipated to be in the, in the genealogy that was going to lead to the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, the one who was going to save Israel from their sins. Rahab was a prostitute. This is not the name that's expected right here in this moment, in the blue blood line that leads to the birth of, the, of Jesus the Messiah. And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. Yikes, here again, Ruth was not, technically speaking, an Israelite. She was a Moabite. She was an outsider. Again, a name that you wouldn't have expected. And then the continuation of this only extends a couple more verses and we hear this, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Who was the wife of Uriah? Bathsheba. The name is not even in the text. What happens in these opening verses is that Matthew begins to just give us a little taste, a taste of what is going to actually track its way all the way through the gospel of Matthew, which is that the gospel is a gospel of surprise. It's a gospel that I sometimes think of as, the, as like the smelling salts gospel, the gospel up your nose. It's as though Matthew here in the very beginning verses is suggesting, you know, you think you know where this is going. You might think about how the narrative is going to unfold, and you think you know who the cast of characters are that God's going to use. Well, let, guess what? God uses whomever God chooses to use. And it includes the names of at least these four unexpected women. And if we went into the narratives of some of the men in the list, just using David as an example, a person who can't get greater in Israel's history, but whose own narrative is actually fraught with all kinds of tensions and issues and compromises that are part of his own narrative. What Matthew, I think, is suggesting here is this. God is working out his purposes. It turns out that as we look back on the swath, God will use whomever God chooses to use, wherever they are, whoever they are, and however it is that God chooses to use them. And it includes people like Tamar and Rahab and Ruth and Bathsheba, four unexpected names. Now, it's interesting that in the beautiful symmetry of this opening genealogy, it says toward the end of this section, beginning at verse 17. So all the generations of Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. It's like a picture of this elegant perfection. 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. The suggestion on one level of the rhetoric is it's just exactly perfect. It is a hallmark Christmas. But then, like fingers on a chalkboard, like a cat jumping at a Christmas tree, like an unexpected set of circumstances, there's an announcement of something very different happening here. It's just what you thought, and then it's not at all like what you thought. God will use whomever God chooses to use. It looks so beautiful. It looks so balanced. It looks so exactly the way it might have been anticipated, except it's not like that. Because the story of Israel is a story of suffering and pain and transition and change and confusion. It's a story of the people of Israel believing and then deeply doubting. It's a story of God's faithfulness and of God calling Israel to be faithful as well, to be mirrors of the faithfulness and love of God. But then it's the story of God relentlessly having to say prophets, send prophets to say, I hate your worship. 
I hate your festivals. I hate the fact that though you claim to be people who follow me, in fact, you seem to just go merrily on your own way with no particular interest in what I'm really about in the world. It's into that kind of circumstance. A circumstance that in some ways can look so good, but underneath can be such a different story. There's not a person that's going to go through Christmas season this year. There's not a person that's going to be at our Christmas table or around our Christmas tree or in the fellowship of this season who doesn't know this human narrative. That on the one hand, there can be things that look so good, and there are other things underneath that that can subvert it and confuse it and challenge it. But here, Matthew's wanting to say so clearly, the great news is that in the middle of this, God is working his faithful purposes out. And in these opening genealogical lists, it's really a picture of this is how it's all going to unfold, and it all stems through the narrative that's going to lead to Joseph. And then that's when the next part of the chapter unfolds in the most wonderful and shocking way. Now, the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. I have to tell you that that verse always makes me laugh. Because the portrait in the genealogy is this story of it's all just going to turn out so well. There are these troubling stories of these certain characters that are unexpected and a little unsavory. Outsiders, not insiders. But it seems so equally balanced. 14, 14, 14, it's all about Joseph. And then without comment, we turn to the birth narrative of Jesus, and it turns out it has nothing to do with Joseph. Do you see the shock? It's like, here, it's all about Joseph, and it's perfectly balanced with a few little exceptions of unexpected people, but it's just marvelously laid out. Part two, and it has nothing to do with Joseph. Because, in fact, it turns out that Mary, though betrothed to Joseph, is going to become pregnant not by Joseph, which would be its own complexity, but something that's just rather observed by the text, by the Holy Spirit. This is a shocking, unbelievable event. It is literally without comparison. It is unique. It's as though, on the one hand, the story of human history can feel so much like it's a product of your energies and mine. Israel could easily tell its story through the leaders that it's had, through the dramas that it's been through, the times of challenge and difficulty. But what Matthew is laying here is all the framework of understanding, here, O Israel, God is your Lord. Hero Israel, God is the one who has been faithful to you, preserving you, walking with you, keeping you. God will do it, God will do it, God will do it. And then 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations, and oh, by the way, now the story opens in an entirely new way, and it has nothing to do with human effort, human ingenuity, human design, human imagination. Here is God's gift of an unexpected pregnancy to an unexpected unknown woman who becomes, though betrothed to Joseph, pregnant, as the text says, by the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. This is a little back to the Rahab scene. It's sort of like, here we go again, another story that seemed to be starting so well, but except it has a lot of complexity. It creates complexity for Joseph. It creates complexity for the people that are around in their family. It's, it's not the narrative of what a faithful family should be telling. It's an awkward moment. It's, it's colored by this unsavory set of experiences, except that it turns out God's in the midst of these unexpected circumstances. And God is the one who's actually working out through Mary a purpose that's actually going to be nothing less than the salvation of the world. But just when he had resolved to do this, to put her away quietly, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Joseph, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Look, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. See, the arc of what's happening here in this second part of chapter one of Matthew is this underlining sense of, are you really paying attention to the story? 
you might feel like it's either in control or out of control. And now with Mary's pregnancy, if you were aware of that and in that family, you might have felt now things really are completely out of control. When in, actually, in actual fact, it turns out that it's in that very moment that God is most in control. And that it's going to be through this unexpected birth that God is going to do something for the salvation of the world that is without peer. Because it's going to be through him. Through the birth of a human being. God taking on human flesh. That we are going to find the one that we should call Emmanuel. The one that is God with us. God had always been for Israel and in A spiritual sense, God had always been with Israel. But now, in the language that Eugene Peterson uses, God is going to move into the neighborhood. He's that with us. He's with us in in a visible, tangible way. And in that withness, God is going to do nothing less than save his people from their sins. In other words, the whole narrative turns on the one who is about to be born to Mary, a young woman unknown, never in any pantheon, unrelated to the great lines of of David, of Abraham, and it was going to be through her, by the Holy Spirit, that this baby was to be born to save his people from their sins. See, the great hope of this text that I think is so important for us to hold on to tonight is this. First of all, we come here from so many different places, don't we? Circumstances, needs. If somehow there was a kind of radar device that I could scan over the congregation, the burdens, the anxieties, the fears, the questions, the uncertainties, the places where life is thriving for you or not, the places where you're full of hope or where you're really more full of fear. In all of those places, God sees you and sees me and says there is a place Just as there was a place for Rahab and Tamar, there was a place for Ruth, and there was a place for Bathsheba, there was a place for anyone that I call by my name. You and I are invited to find our story in this deep narrative of God's faithfulness. It includes us. If it didn't include people like this, we might wonder whether or not we could ever be good enough. This little genealogy in the opening verses of Matthew says, oh no, 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 this is a plan for the world. It includes people of all different kinds, needs, questions, doubts, faith, disbelief, insiders, outsiders. God, the God that is introduced to us here, the God that summarizes in many ways the great history of Israel and the God that's now working in Jesus, this is the one who knows you by name. He calls you by name. He sees you and understands who you are, understands what your questions are and your anxieties, your places of neediness, the the concerns you have for family or friends or for the world that's around us. Our narrative is not out of control. It's not outside the sight of a God who sees us and knows us by name. That narrative is our narrative. God holds our story, and that is the hope. But then, then in the middle of that story, God is the one Not through the line of Joseph, not through some predictable line of birth as though it's a divine right of kings, not as though it's just passed on genetically through some sort of protean vision of someone or something who could somehow arise and have the native strength to be able to be our redeemer. No, this is a gift of unexpected interrupting grace. The shock. The incarnation, God becoming human flesh, is a shock. It is a theological shock. If it's If it's something that we've so internalized that it's just become normative, we're not remembering what it is that's actually happening here in Matthew and in the story of God's redemption in Christ. This isn't like anyone or anything else. This is God doing something on our behalf which we were desperately in need of God doing and which we could never do for ourselves. Everyone gets included, so the genealogy says, even unlikely and unexpected people, but also God is doing something that will trump anything that is part of human energy or effort, our strengths or our weaknesses. God has given to us in Christ a gift that is without any comparison. For this is Emmanuel, the one who comes truly to be with us. This church is in a season of all kinds of disruption. It's 
dislodging, it's disorienting, it's confusing. I'm, I'm sure that there are people among you that feel all kinds of different things about a transition like this. This narrative says, remember that it's a much bigger story and that you're in it. You're in it, you have a very important place in it. God wants to call you and use you to be in this church, in this community, whatever it is that God may want to do through you. Don't suggest that somehow because you, you may or may not be this or you may or may not be that, that somehow you're at the edge when in fact God will choose to use whomever God chooses to use. And often it's in transition times like this that in many churches people find their voice. They find and discover their calling. They are refined in their understanding of what the church is. They have to wake up to our own responsibility. They have to realize that it's not about a person in leadership, that it's about this long narrative that's God's alone to actually own and control and guide. And the good news is, that's the very thing God is committed to doing. But then God has something much more than that to give you. You're not just given a place. You're given, as this text in Matthew says, you and I are given a savior. Now frankly, when we're thinking, as most of us in this room would do, we're a people who live with competence. We have, in most cases, great education. We have opportunity and access to all kinds of things. We are able to do many things for ourselves. We don't walk around necessarily in any given day as though we're walking down the street saying, I need a savior, I need a savior, I need a savior. And yet if we could understand our story at the very core, this text says to us what you need more than you might even yet fully recognize. More deeply than you might know even on your darkest day, is that you not only need a savior, but you have a savior. And that savior is not somebody who's distant, it's someone who's come near. This is the shock again of the incarnation. God has moved into the neighborhood. And there's nothing that we have to be anxious about as though our sin or our neediness is unknown to God, as though God would be shocked if we were to confess to God, do you know, I, I just do have this need. Now, there's nothing about that that would that would ever surprise or shock God. God sees us in the reality of who we are and can do something for us in Christ that really no one and nothing else can do. Think about the world tonight. Think about the array of places, people, circumstances. We have the needs that we experience here in our own individual lives that we might be carrying very heavily in our own family or our own loved ones, friends, children, parents, grandparents, all kinds of concerns that we might have. But remember that there's this also this much wider story. As I drove from Pasadena down here this afternoon, I wended my way through lots of different neighborhoods, I, albeit on the freeway on this occasion, but the stories of all of those lives, the stories of the literally millions of lives between here and Pasadena, each distinctly stories that matter to the God who made each of those people with all of their hopes and anxieties, all of their abilities and competencies or incompetencies, their, their sins and their great strengths and righteousness. God knows all of those stories. And in a much wider way, we live now in a nation that is still feeling the reverberations of a very divided political season of, of the, the part of the nation that's celebrating and the part of the nation that's in grief and fear. And all of that is also known by the God who holds our great narrative and a God who wants to say to all of us, oh, I see you, I know you by name, and I love you. There's nothing that you could throw my way that I don't know that I'm unconcerned about. And therefore, come to me, whether you're in this nation, whether you're in this region, or if we extend our imagination even further, we can think around the globe, whether we think in places like Syria, or in parts of Africa, or in Asia, or South Asia, or in Latin America, where there is so much life and often so much need. The God that we're hearing about tonight in this text is the God who knows all of that story, shares and holds it all, and wants to offer his life to us in that hope. See, the great good news is, is not that you, 
you're gonna get beyond the transition. In a certain way, I hope that you never get beyond a sense of transition. I hope that you never get beyond a feeling that you are always a community of people always in need of remembering these kind of first order things. That you belong to a great story and all of you are invited and included. And that God alone is your redeemer. It just turns out that's never a pastor. It's never any given human leader. It's never a person who stands in a certain place at a certain time for a certain season. It's actually the reminder to go back again and recall that God is the one who alone is that savior. And that God shares all of our story. I did not grow up in a Christian home. I grew, outside, uh, grew up outside the life of the church. My, my dad was a wonderful father and a great man, a, an inventor, a very kind guy who had a great vision of the world. He had a great concern for religion, and he thought that religion was a very damaging thing to human beings. So he really encouraged my brother and me to do as, everything we possibly could to stay as far away from religion as we could possibly get. He saved certain neck veins for the discussion of this topic because he was so concerned to make his point with us. Eventually, what I saw was that the good news, as I started reading under my own curiosity the Gospels, was that Jesus was the one who really had a lot of concern about religion, just like my dad did. And in fact, I used to needle my dad by saying, you know, you and Jesus really have much more in common than you would ever think. My dad's great concern was what religion does is that it takes great things and makes them small. So you think of the universe and under a certain lens it all becomes a a small philosophical project about the nature of, of origins of creation. Or you take the mystery of what it means to be a human being and you put it under a certain kind of religious lens and it all becomes a debate about whether you're a person that's doing right or doing wrong. As though all of life is about nothing more than moral choice. When I started reading the Gospels, what shocked me was that Jesus' portrait of what saves us is the kingdom of God, the good news of a kingdom that actually delivers us from smallness because what extends our heart and enlarges our mind and engages our will and calls us into a new community of people is actually this great kingdom that delivers us from this. And that reality, that reality has continued to be the reality of my hope in all the years that I've been a Christian. My faith has awakened. I'm just a freshman in college at the time. My mom, whose faith was latent, begins to awaken. She goes to a church. She meets a pastor. The pastor hears hears a bit of her story. She tells the pastor that her son's had some sort of religious experience. So he says, well, then I'd like to come and call on him. So on an otherwise perfectly wonderful spring day in my freshman year, uprolled this unknown pastor to have a pastoral visit with me. I found the whole thing kind of awkward. I'm sitting in my parents' living room. It was all sort of strange and ill-fitting at the time. He said, you know, I want you to know that I've come for three reasons. Um, The first is that that your mom told me you had a religious experience. Second reason is that that might mean that you're going to become a pastor. Now, this was about as far from my mind at that time as anything could possibly have been. And the third thing is, if you do become a pastor, I just want to be sure that you know which denomination has the best pension plan. (laughs) Just absorb that for a few minutes. So I told my dad that story that night at dinner. He was a kind man. He didn't pounce. He just sort of absorbed the story. He said, you know, um, you know, I, I know that you think what's happening is that you're getting to know the God of the universe. I know that that's what you think's what's happening. But I just have to tell you, it's gonna end in a pension plan. (laughs) If any single experience has explained my whole life, it was that moment. Because I believed, as this text says, as the whole rest of Matthew will go on to explore, God is delivering us from a pension plan as the great outcome of our lives. God has no small visions. God has personal visions, intimate visions, but God has a vision for the remaking of everything. And it includes you and me in that process. And I'm not being a person who's set on a road toward nothing more than a pension plan. I was getting to know the God of the universe. I have spent my life getting to know more of the God of the universe, made known in Jesus Christ. 
And that has been the deliverance, the salvation, the Emmanuel experience of what it is to actually live into the purposes of God's life for me and for the world. This text is like the crack, the thing that opens up that possibility. We could decide that life is nothing more than a pension plan or some other outcome that we might want. Some good, some desire, some gift, some achievement, some treasure, some value, some house, some job, some relationship. All of those are legitimate and important things, but they are not meant to be our life's outcome. What Matthew 1 says is, do you know what? Your life is set in the most extraordinary setting. A God who holds the whole human narrative and knows your name and wants to include you in that story, whoever you are and however unexpected you may feel that to be. And God, in Christ, is going to do something on your behalf that's going to open up our small-hearted, small-mindedness to actually begin to share something of the life of God that sees and loves and engages the world in ways that are transformative, that are beautiful, that are just, that are life-giving, and that are filled with nothing less than the very love of God. Friends, this unexpected opening chapter to Matthew, it's actually the start of everything. It's the expression of God's eternal faithfulness made known in Jesus Christ that changes your life and can change the lives of many, many others. May that be the story that we live and live into in this Advent and through all the time of this season of church transition at St. Andrews, but far, far beyond that as well.